Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 33. Constitutional Crisis. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last time, we had a guest episode from the Industrial Revolutions podcast, which I hope everyone enjoyed. The time before that, we saw the aftermath of the assassination of George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham, and how his murder was received across the kingdoms. Mostly, as we saw, it was celebrated, as was his killer. Obviously, this was far from a universal reaction, and we also looked at the reactions of two men who were devastated at the news. Charles, of course, and also William Lord. And the two of them would bond over their shared loss. Politically, Buckingham's death had the potential for serious change. At the royal court, Buckingham's monopoly on power was now broken and there were those eager to swoop in to collect what spoils they could. When Parliament was recalled, as it soon would be, they too would see the absence of Buckingham as an opportunity. If you recall, Charles had prorogued the parliamentary session in June 1628, as criticism against Buckingham had resulted in a formal remonstrance and as the petition of right was being brought to bear against the king. One of those issues had now been resolved in that pub in Portsmouth, but tonnage and poundage remained a serious grievance. As a reminder, tonnage and poundage were traditional trade duties that Parliament usually granted the monarch for life. For Charles, though, Parliament had tried to limit the grant to a single year, and so forced the king to recall Parliament in order to legally collect them. Instead, Charles just collected it anyway, imprisoning merchants who refused to pay, while the limited bill became bogged down in the House of Lords, where it stayed until the king angrily dissolved the session. Legally speaking, Charles had no leg to stand on. The Petition of Right, the political battle that dominated the first session of Parliament the previous year, had become the basis of another attack on Charles's collection of the duty, and it was in the midst of this that Charles suspended Parliament. This was the monarchical equivalent of sticking his fingers in his ears and avoiding the question, and so it's no surprise that the issue hadn't gone away in January 1629. Everyone, Charles and the Commons both, accepted that the problem of tonnage and poundage had to be resolved. The problem was that their solutions were mutually exclusive. Not that tonnage and poundage was the only grievance the Commons had. Oh no, because religion. Charles had been advised by his bishops to forbid discussion of certain topics, such as, but not limited to, predestination. He had finally banned the publication of a controversial book written by Richard Montague, but he had delayed too long, and resisted too strongly, for this to put the worries of Montague's enemies to bed. Charles had also appointed several bishops during 1629, and many of them were famously anti-Calvinist in outlook. These included, of course, William Lord and Richard Montague. Lord had already been a bishop of Bath and Wells, but he had now been translated to become Bishop of London. The Calvinist-leaning commons saw this as a worrying trend that just followed on from the controversies of the past few years. Charles had also granted a full pardon to a bishop who Parliament had attempted to impeach for supporting the forced loan. None of this helped ease the concerns of a parliament that feared their king was an absolutist Arminian, determined to do away with parliament and true religion. When parliament reconvened, 
these two issues came up immediately. Charles expected the mere ratification of his traditional right to collect tonnage and poundage. But in the eyes of the commons, he had been collecting this tariff illegally for years, and they were unwilling to simply accept this. To vote him the right now would simply condone his behaviour. They had the petition of right, after all, which the king had accepted, and which explicitly acknowledged that such collections were illegal. The commons began investigating the imprisonment of merchants and the seizure of their goods, specifically relating to a member of parliament who had been on the receiving end of royal agents. On the religious front, the commons appointed a committee to consider the church, and on the 24th of February, 1629, this committee made a series of resolutions aimed at the, quote, subtle and pernicious spreading of the Arminian faction. They advised Charles to appoint, as bishops, quote, learned, pious, and orthodox men. And they had a very specific type of pious and orthodox in mind. Specific criticism was made against Montague, Lord, and the Bishop of Winchester, Roger Mainwaring. This last attack was the only recorded act of a fresh-faced MP, the representative of the constituency of Huntingdon. By all accounts, it wasn't a very impressive speech, but he had potential. Maybe this Oliver Cromwell will make something of himself in a future episode. It's important to point out that in this case, the Commons were acting more or less alone. The House of Lords, which had so often been aligned with the lower house over their shared hatred of Buckingham, now stayed out of it. The up-jumped gentleman was dead, after all, and so they busied themselves passing a few acts of their own and staying out of the brewing conflict between the King and the Commons. Now, that's not to say that there was no collaboration between Lords and Commons. There was, especially on matters of religion. But this was mostly relegated to informal, under-the-table encouragement from the Lords. So. Did Charles take these criticisms to heart? Did he listen to the complaints of his subjects, and take the opportunity of Buckingham's death to strike a new course that would lead to peace, harmony, and justice for all? Well, no, obviously. From Charles's point of view, the Commons had overstepped, once again, into matters that did not concern them. They were there to vote him taxation. He had collected tonnage and poundage as it was his right Legality didn't come into it. He was the supreme governor of the Church of England, and the path of that church was down to him and him alone. The day after the Committee on Religion made its proposals, as was his idiom, Charles adjourned Parliament for a week. You can't say he isn't consistent. When the Houses returned on the 2nd of March, it was only for a day. What followed was one of the liveliest days in parliamentary history, with Charles's authority openly flouted, and the Kingdom of England facing a constitutional crisis. On the 2nd of March, Parliament returned from its week-long hiatus. Before the adjournment, Sir John Eliot had once again orchestrated an attack on government policy, and in a speech declared that the Lord Treasurer, quote, in whose person all evil is contracted. I find him acting and building on those grounds, laid by his master, the great Duke, and his spirit is moving to these interruptions, and they, for fear, break Parliament, lest Parliaments should break them. I find him the head of all the great party the Papists, all Jesuits and priests derived from him their shelter and protection. After this, the Commons attempted to pass a motion, the subject of which I'll touch on shortly, because the Speaker, Sir John Finch, refused to put the question to the House for them to vote. He had, he said, been otherwise commanded from the King. This, as you might imagine, caused an uproar. Another MP, John Selden, then spoke. 
Dare not you, Mr. Speaker, put the question when we command you? If you will not put it, we must sit still. Thus, we shall never be able to do anything. They that come after you may say, they have the king's command not to do it. We sit here by the command of the king under the great seal. And you are, by his majesty, sitting in this royal chair, before both houses, appointed for our speaker. And now you refuse to perform your office. It was the day after that Parliament was adjourned for the week, and so on the second they returned with unfinished business, and had taken the week to prepare their resolutions. Again, the Commons attempted to vote, and again the Speaker refused. He had been ordered by the King to adjourn for another week. This had been expected by certain elements of the Commons, and they were prepared. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B A B B E L dot com code Recorded History. Babbel language for life. When the speaker attempted to rise from his chair and pronounce the session adjourned, several MPs physically held him down in his chair. As you might expect, Several other MPs took one look at this legally grey act and the potential implications of treason and did their best to get away. They found that the doors to the House of Commons had been locked. Finch reportedly broke down weeping, and it's hard not to feel for the man. He had his colleagues physically restraining him, demanding that he go against the orders of his monarch. Yet Elliot's argument that he had been made Speaker to allow the Commons to perform its function was just as valid. I am not the less the King's servant for being yours, Finch pushed through his tears. I will not say, I will not put it to the question, but I must say I dare not. While this pandemonium was taking place, the King's sergeant attempted to remove the mace. This represented the presence of Charles, as by tradition the monarch could not enter the House of Commons. While it was present, so too was the king, and so the business of Parliament could be held. If it was removed, well, during a debate in December 2018, an MP grabbed the mace in protest. The sergeant-at-arms took it off him after just a few seconds, because, in the MP's words, I wasn't going to struggle with someone wearing a huge sword on their hip. That MP was suspended from the House for a day, but it wasn't the first time, and it won't be the last, that the mace has played a role in protesting a government. However, this time the doors were locked, and the sergeant was prevented from reaching the mace in time. With the mace in position and the speaker in his chair, Denzil Hollers, MP for Dorchester, took to the floor and put the three resolutions to the House, 
I'll now read these in full, because unlike so many other early modern legal texts, this is actually fairly straightforward. Quote, Whosoever shall bring in innovation of religion, or by favour or countenance seem to extend or introduce popery or Arminianism, or other opinion disagreeing from the truth and orthodox church, shall be reputed a capital enemy to this kingdom and commonwealth. Whosoever shall counsel or advise the taking and levying of the subsidies of tonnage and poundage, not being granted by Parliament, or shall be an actor or instrument therein, shall be likewise reputed an innovator in the government and a capital enemy to the kingdom and commonwealth. If any merchant or person whatsoever shall voluntarily yield or pay the said subsidies of tonnage and poundage not being granted by Parliament, he shall likewise be reputed a betrayer of the liberties of England and an enemy to the same. This all read out, and for the last time, in eleven years, the House of Commons echoed with shouts of I. Now, everyone knew that there was not a snowball's chance in hell that these resolutions would be put into practice. It was a protest, as strong a protest as could yet be imagined against the policy of Charles's government and there would be consequences for denying the king's will in such a drastic way. When the doors were finally opened, and the sergeants forced their way in, Sir John Finch finally managed to adjourn the session. Charles, naturally, dissolved the Parliament, and his proclamation lay this at the feet of the Commons, quote, It hath so happened, by the disobedient, and seditious carriage of those said ill-affected persons of the House of Commons, that we, and our regal authority and commandment, have been so highly condemned, as our kingly office cannot bear, nor any former age can parallel." End quote. But Charles made sure to make it clear that it was only certain members of the lower house that were at fault, quote, Nevertheless, we will, that they, and all others, shall take notice, that we do and ever will distinguish between those who have showed good affection to religion and government, and those that have given themselves over to faction, and to work disturbance to the peace and good order of our kingdom. The next day, the ringleaders of the unrest were summoned to see the king. Both Hollers and Elliot were among those who answered the summons, and after refusing to discuss the events in the Commons, they were committed to the Tower of London. In total, nine MPs would be arrested for the events of the 2nd of March. Star Chamber, which is something I really look forward to looking at in the future, charged them with sedition. Some would be released fairly quickly, the message hopefully received. But Charles had a grudge against Sir John Eliot. Politically, he was a repeated pain in the neck, constantly championing the rights of Parliament and attempting to set limits on his monarchical rights. Personally, Charles believed Eliot shared part of the blame for the death of the Duke of Buckingham. He had spread slander, in Charles's eyes, against the Duke, and this had motivated Felton to assassinate him. For both of these reasons, Eliot would remain imprisoned for the rest of his life. If he had cooperated, perhaps he would have been released. But he didn't. He repeatedly invoked parliamentary privilege and denied the authority of the courts he faced. Until he backed down and submitted himself to the king, he would remain in the tower. This was not a pleasant incarceration, with many of the ordinary allowances for imprisoned notables refused to him. In 1632 he became ill and requested time to recover in the countryside. The answer came back, and the cost for this mercy was his submission. And he refused. He died of tuberculosis in November 1632, at the age of 40. The grudge didn't end there. Charles refused the request of Eliot's son, also called John, to move his body, and so Eliot remains in the Tower of London. 
This parliamentary dissolution marks the beginning of Charles's famous, infamous, personal rule. And in the new year, we will enter an entirely new phase of the narrative. What's that? The new year? Yes, you heard me right. Over the next few weeks, instead of normal episodes of Pax Britannica, I have some great bonus episodes in the pipeline. I know we've been a bit heavy on bonus episodes over the last few months, but balancing my PhD with the Christmas period is tough, and I hope to have at least a few days off from my many, many projects. So, next week will be a collaborative episode discussion between myself and David from the Siakla, as we discuss the similarities and differences of the two assassinations we've both recently covered. For me, obviously, the Duke of Buckingham, and for him, the Duke de Berry. Then we have episodes from the History of Aotearoa New Zealand podcast, as well as the Political History of the United States. Then, depending on whether I actually take time off, the jury is still out, we'll begin the new year running. Remember to follow me on Twitter, at SamuelHume10 and at BritannicaPax, to keep up to date with what's going on. Pax Britannica is also about to hit another milestone, of 200,000 downloads, That's amazing, and thank you to everyone who has left reviews, or recommended to a friend, or posted about it online. As always, I'd like to thank my House of Lords for supporting me on Patreon. Now, this is a good problem to have, and I'm honoured to have this problem, but the list of shoutouts is getting a bit long, so in 2020 I may have to have a rethink. Maybe only announce new members of the House of Lords, or randomly pick a few. Either way, that's a problem for another time. Thank you. Executed today. Her Grace, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich. His Grace, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin. The Most Honourable, Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer. The Right Honourable, Countess of Shrewsbury, Elaine Dickens. Countess of Surrey, Jean Buckley. Earl of Oxford, Christopher Grogan. Earl of Somerset, Brendan Bonner. Countess of Cornwall, Belinda Clarence. Earl of Hereford, Christopher Rema. Earl of Dunbar, Angus Wilson. Earl of Northumberland, Michael Thomas. The Earl of Southampton, Alan Goldstein. The Earl of Northampton, Justin Drowns. The Earl of Nottingham, John Toogood. The Earl of Leicester, Jim Du Bois. Stephen, Earl of Warwick. The Earl of Bradford, Richard Liddell. The Countess of Clarendon, Mandy Wright. David, Earl of Montgomery. The Earl of Derby, Jonathan Musselman. The Earl of Carlisle, Ian Lester. And our new Earls, the Earl of Albany, Howard Lewis the Earl of Rosario, James Farina, the Earl of Lincoln, Adam Foote, the Earl of Huntington, David Morehouse, and the Earl of Winchester, Alistair Slade. Thanks again to my entire House of Lords, to Sounds Like an Earful for the music in today's episode, and, most of all, to you for listening.